As a second-generation American-born Armenian living in Los Angeles, the idea of going back to my ancestral homeland in Western Armenia always seemed elusive, unrealistic, and even a bit terrifying. Western Armenia is, after all, currently occupied by Turkey, the perpetrator of the Armenian Genocide in which one and a half million of my people were slaughtered between 1915 and 1923 as the Turks tried to annihilate the Armenian population which had inhabited that land for over 4,000 years. It is the land on which Armenia had been the first nation to accept Christianity as its state religion back in 301 AD, thereafter building thousands of breathtakingly beautiful cathedrals, churches, and monasteries on steep mountaintops and in deep canyons, on serene lake shores and on grassy hillsides only to be destroyed and defaced or converted into mosques or museums after the genocide. Today, only a handful of these ancient structures still stubbornly stand in ruins as a testament to the resiliency of my people who are no longer there to worship at their altars. Western Armenia is the land which continues to remain under the control of an unrepentant Turkish government which even now, a century after the Armenian Genocide, refuses to acknowledge this unpunished crime against humanity or to take any steps toward justice for its victims and their descendants. And Western Armenia is the land from which my four grandparents had barely escaped the genocide after dozens of their family members, my family members, were massacred simply for being Armenian. In the hundred years since the genocide, each generation has continuously sought justice for this crime and has called upon the worldwide community of nations to hold Turkey accountable for the mass destruction of Armenian lives and property. In Los Angeles alone, 166,000 of us marched for justice on the April 24, 2015 centennial, still raising our voices after a hundred years and showing the world that our demands will continue until justice is served. After waiting for many years, the opportunity to journey back to my homeland with a small group of dear friends finally came in May 2014. And based on events that have since unfolded in Turkey, which have now turned much of Western Armenia into a war zone, where a new genocide by the Turkish government is tragically looming against the Kurds, I am so grateful that we went when we did. We were all deeply conflicted by the thought of being tourists in present-day Turkey, and we were entirely unsure of how we would react to the reality of our occupied homeland. It turned out to be a truly life-changing experience for all of us, which I hope to share through this short film, to convey the unimaginable magnitude of our collective loss, the pride in our rich and ancient history, and to awaken in those who see it a sense of longing and belonging, identity, hope, perseverance, and ultimately an individual and collective will to triumph over adversity. We had to fly from the U.S. into Istanbul, but the purpose of our trip was to go to see Western Armenia in southeastern Turkey. We decided we were not going to be typical tourists, so we limited our days there to visiting only Armenian sites. To my surprise, being surrounded by Turks, eating the foods we all know, and hearing the language and music in the streets and restaurants all felt eerily familiar, as I used to hear my grandparents speak to each other in Turkish when they didn't want us to understand. The Turks looked like us and we looked like them. Walking on the streets of Istanbul, tourists from America, Europe and Asia were easily identifiable, but the Turks we encountered spoke Turkish to us, thinking we were natives. Our first stop in Western Armenia was in Elazig, or Kharpert, where some members of my family had their roots. 
The plane ride was unsettling, as the flight map showed us flying over Yozgat, Malatya, Erzurum, Yerzunga, Sivas, Sepastia, all familiar names of old Armenian towns which had been subjected to massacres and deportation. The sense of loss set in, as I realized for the first time that I was breathing the same air and walking the same roads where members of my family, people that I actually knew in my lifetime, were born, raised, and then exiled from their ancestral homes. And then came the grief of knowing that the new generation, and those who are still to come, will never be able to experience that first-hand connection with my grandparents' generation, since there are virtually no genocide survivors left on this earth. We visited a museum house in Kharpert, labeled as a typical affluent Turkish household at the turn of the last century, which still had much of its original furniture. As we wandered through, we were shocked to discover a silver plate engraved with Armenian letters, Dr. Alexan. The Turks were trying to erase the presence of Armenians, but there it was. Upon finding Khulavank in a small village outside of Kharpert, we discovered, as we were to consistently find throughout our journey, that the altar area of every church is dug up with broken stones strewn around. Apparently, the Armenians had hidden gold and other riches in the floors of these churches, deceived into believing that their deportation was only temporary and they would be back to reclaim them. Obviously, they never did come back, and the local Turks dug them up and stole them, since there is nothing left. Even worse was the fact that the bases of the stone columns in these churches have been chipped away by Turks hoping they will collapse once their structural foundation is weakened. And yet these ancient churches, many over a thousand years old, have withstood defacement, graffiti, attacks, and destruction. The highlight of Kharpert was our climb to the ruins of Palu Castle at the top of a mountain bearing a huge Turkish flag that can be seen from miles away. The castle was built in the 9th century BC by King Menwa of Urartu, but like every other Armenian site in Turkey, the sign gives no hint that it is Armenian. We hiked to the cliff overlooking the beautiful Palu Peninsula, on which the ruins of a lone Armenian church still stand. I was haunted by the memory of a family elder telling me years ago how his mother and her sister watched in horror as Armenians being herded into the church at Palu by Turkish soldiers were burned alive while these two little girls could hear their agonized screams and do nothing but run for their lives. There's a lake near Kharpert. It's called Lake Golchuk, although now they call it Lake Hazar. And um, Leslie Davis wrote about it in his book, Slaughterhouse Province. He had heard, he was the council in Kharpert, and he had heard that the men, the Armenian men of Kharpert and the surrounding villages were being taken out of Kharpert and slaughtered. And he wasn't sure if it was true or not, so he wanted to see for himself. He was told that they were being brought to the area around Lake Goldrick. So he went out early one morning, before sunrise, on horseback. He did that so nobody would see him. He rode out to the lake, and he wrote in a classified State Department report to the U.S. State Department that he observed what he estimated to be 10,000 fresh corpses. The report that he wrote was classified by state until about 1962. And it was unclassified, declassified in 1962. And so that's why we know about that report today. So we're going to see that link. Okay, thank you. As we stood on the banks of Hazar Lake, it was so hard to imagine that we were standing on a killing field and that this serene and beautiful place also witnessed such human suffering and death. Today, it is a picnic area. The ancient Armenian village of Chungush used to have a population of 10,000. It had a huge two-story Orthodox cathedral adjacent to the ruins of an old Armenian Catholic church. Now there was no one left. 
we met Asya, a tiny 95-year-old daughter of an Armenian genocide survivor who was raised by a Muslim Kurd. Her son-in-law, Rejai, was a Kurdish activist who was imprisoned and endured the torture of having all his teeth forcibly pulled. Jai took us down to the Dudan Gorge, the most haunting and difficult part of our journey, as we learned that virtually all 10,000 Armenians who lived in Chungush in 1915 were marched down to that gorge, stripped naked, and thrown into the bowels of the earth to their deaths. It has got to be one of the worst places in the world. As we all stood in solemn silence at the edge of that gorge, we could hear the screams of people falling to their deaths as they echoed through that dark and deep hole in the earth's surface. That was definitely the toughest day of our journey, and we all had difficulty processing our emotions. As we drove to Lake Vaughan, passing hundreds of miles of vacant land, I could not help but think how this land was once inhabited for centuries by its indigenous Armenian population, only to become lonely and devoid of life, with the exception of an occasional shepherd with his sheep. It's a very symbolic day for all of us to be gathered here, and today was a testimony that the world is so large yet so small. We've got filmmakers, we've got historians, we have authors, people from all walks of life. And the common thread that ties us together are that we're passionate Armenians searching for answers. This was a great trip. It was a, moment, it was a, it was a time to reflect and to reevaluate. A lot of questions were answered and a lot of new questions have risen. Lake Van is a beautiful, clear, blue body of water, referred in ancient times as a sea rather than a lake, due to its size. We chartered a boat and spent the entire day exploring its cultural wealth. George Aljayan had found a cemetery nearby on one of his satellite image searches and we hiked down to the edge of Lake Vaughan to find it. There were easily more than 150 graves there, largely intact. It was obvious that this was a newer village, as many of the gravestones had dates in the 1800s carved on them. The most moving one had an inscription in Armenian, no name, no date, just the words, Hishek Eats, remember me. It sent chills down my spine as I silently whispered a prayer for that poor Armenian soul whose grave had not been visited for at least a hundred years since the genocide. We remember you. As we sailed to our much-anticipated visit to Akhtamar Island and came around a bend on Lake Van, we were shocked to see a huge Turkish flag flying in front of it. Ahtamar's church was emotionally difficult to visit. The Turkish government has restored its beauty, no doubt, but it has also converted it into a museum, allowing Armenian mass to be conducted there only once per year on a date of its choosing. We had to pay admission to get in, and we had to try to ignore a group of Turkish men mocking the Christian symbols as we tried to absorb the wonder of the beautiful carvings. Our dilemma was whether preservation outranks exploitation. Was it better for our ancient structures to be restored by the Turkish government for its own benefit, but at least to know that they will be preserved, albeit exploited? Or was it better to let them crumble and eventually disappear? 
Either way, we all left Achtamar feeling as if we had been violated in some way, and it was not a good feeling at all. On the outskirts of Van, we visited Varakavank. These three arches fell in the earthquake three years ago. This was destroyed by the Turks in 1915, the Turkish oh. army. The Turkish army destroyed this, wow. wiped it down. Now what we have is this doorway, yes. this building right here. Yes. So they wiped off everything above the candle. Wow. Got destroyed. That was the most offensive to them. Yeah. This they didn't destroy, and it was used as a barn. Mm -hmm. The ruins of Ani are an official tourist site in eastern Turkey, and our experience there was similar to what we felt at Ahtamar. Once the land of a thousand and one churches, Ani's remaining structures are being restored by the Turkish government in exchange for it being named as a UNESCO site generating substantial income for the state. The most striking thing about Ani is the fact that it is right on the border with Armenia. In fact, one month before this particular trip, I went to the small village of Ani Avan in Armenia and traveled right to the border where I could clearly see the ruins of Ani from the eastern Armenia side. I took rocks from there as souvenirs and joined them with the rocks I took from the Western Armenia side in a symbolic attempt to unite Armenia into the homeland that it is. Visiting Diyarbakir, previously known as Dikranagird, was a highlight of our trip, bringing hope and optimism to the prospect of the revitalization of Western Armenia. Now a predominantly Kurdish large city controlled by the HDP, a political party whose ideology is very supportive of the Armenian cause, Diyarbakir in 2014 was a bustling mix of intercultural respect. Part of the HDP's party platform is to recognize the Armenian genocide, apologize for the role the Kurds played in slaughtering their Armenian neighbors, try to make restitution, and to call on the Turkish government to do the same. This is not just idle talk. The highway welcome sign leading into the city is written in Kurdish, Turkish, and Armenian, Pariegak. The ancient cathedral of Surpkiragos, the largest Armenian church in the Middle East with a capacity of 3,000 people and seven altars, was built in the 14th century burned, destroyed, and rebuilt several times until 1915 when it was destroyed by the Turks and left empty by its Armenian parishioners who were massacred during the genocide. It has now been restored. In 2011, after the HDP came to power in Diyarbakir, and after Armenians in Istanbul and the diaspora began matching funds from the Kurdish municipality for its renovation, Surpkiragos Cathedral was reopened in all its glory and returned by the municipal government to the Armenian Patriarchate. Deeds found there prove that over half of the city belonged to the church before the genocide, but a hundred years later there were seemingly no Armenians left there to stake their claims. But once the church reopened, something miraculous happened. It served as a catalyst for Islamized Armenians to come out and bravely declare their true identity, and over a hundred of them started coming to the church, maintaining it, taking Armenian language classes, and even getting baptized there. Having met several of them during our visit, it was clear that they craved the brotherhood and support of the Armenian diaspora, and their courage in changing their names from Abdul Rahman to Armen and others is truly worthy of our highest praise and encouragement. Visiting two separate bookstores in Diyarbakir, we were pleasantly surprised to find entire sections devoted to the Armenian Genocide, with books in Turkish, Kurdish, English, French, and German lining the shelves. We also found dictionaries translating Turkish and Kurdish words into Armenian, 
for anyone wanting to learn our language. And indeed, we met many Kurds who were truly apologetic and wanted to help us seek justice. After growing up hearing nothing but revisions of history and genocide denial from the Turkish government and its representatives, hearing these Kurds say these words was surreal and enlightening. We had the privilege of meeting the oldest Armenian couple in Diyarbakir, Digin Baidzar and Baron Sarkis, both in their 80s. In broken Armenian, Digin Baidzar told us that both she and her husband of 60 years are the children of genocide survivors and that they have tried to maintain their Armenian identity. Two weeks before our visit, they were remarried at Surpgiragos Cathedral in a ceremony officiated by the female Kurdish mayor of Diyarbakir. Sadly, two weeks after we returned home from our trip, we got the news that Digin Baidzar had passed away. And in January 2016, we received the news that Baron Sarkis had also passed away. Because of the round-the-clock curfew imposed by the Turkish government by this time in Diyarbakir and throughout Kurdish-populated areas of Western Armenia, Funeral services for Baron Sarkis could not be held at Surpiragos Church, as people are now afraid to leave their homes for fear of being shot or captured by military snipers. In the center of Diyarbakir, a monument to genocide victims was recently unveiled, with an inscription in seven languages, Kurdish, Turkish, English, Armenian, Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek, which reads, we shared the pains so that they are not suffered again. But alas, the pains are being suffered again. In fear of losing its control, the Turkish government is now targeting the Kurdish civilian populations of Diyarbakir and other regions of southeastern Turkey, engaging in round two of its genocidal policies and calling the Kurds Armenian bastards, referring to the fact that many of today's Kurds in the region have Armenian ancestry from Islamized survivors of the genocide. So it's uh, May 30th and we're in the airport at Gars and we finished up our trip to Western Armenia. We're heading back to Istanbul for one night and then we head home tomorrow morning. So I just wanted to ask each person in our group about their impressions, what their expectations were coming in, and what their impressions were leaving Western Armenia. So Becky's up first. Um, there's a saying, parting is such sweet sorrow, and that's, that's really how I feel right now. And we had a very diverse group of uh, travelers from um, artists, writers, filmmakers, activists, and we all had one um, common thread that we shared, is that we're all survivors, we're all grandchildren of survivors. Um, what was great to finally be able to do was to actually connect um, with Western Armenia, because I think up until now it, it's been um, just something we've heard about and talked about seeing and going to and, and getting these lands back. Uh, they cannot rupture our ties to this land. Um, for me, that is uh, critically important that that message gets conveyed because for 70 years we were absent from this land and the only message that conveys is disinterest in the land. Um, I think they are shocked and amazed at a number of things when we come here. One, that we come here at all after a hundred years. Two, that some, some of us speak the language as if we're native speakers. And three, that we know the land and the history like we were born here, even after a hundred years. So. For me, the quest for justice is not only patriotic, it is deeply personal, as a legacy passed down most notably by my paternal grandmother, Virgin Jihanyan Kalupjan, the sole survivor of her large family in Yerzinga, 
who as a terrified nine-year-old little girl saw the men of her family axed to death by Turkish soldiers. Her mother and siblings drown around her in the Euphrates River as she instinctively held onto the branch of a weeping willow tree just to survive. She was rescued by a Kurdish family and then sent to an American Near East Relief Orphanage before immigrating to the United States where she married another genocide survivor and raised her only son, my father. It is to my grandmother, Virgin, and to my father, George Kalipjan, that I lovingly dedicate this film. It was, after all, he who encouraged me to travel to Western Armenia when he could not, asking me to document my journey so he could see the homeland through my eyes. We couldn't leave Western Armenia without at least placing our feet on the base of Mount Ararat as we could not do so from the Eastern Armenia side of the border since it's under Turkish control. So we hiked two miles from the main road to the base of the mountain as we reaffirmed to ourselves and each other that we want our mountain back. Reflecting upon this life-altering trip, I would strongly urge and encourage every Armenian to take the same journey. I learned that our homeland is not some esoteric or ambiguous figment of our imagination. It is real, it is waiting for us, it is crying out for its flock. Our claim to it cannot remain theoretical. The people there, the Kurds and the Turks, need to know that we are connected. We have not given up. We will never give up until justice is restored to our people. This is our burden, our duty, and our responsibility to all the innocent souls whose blood and bones nourish the soil. It is our ongoing journey back to the homeland.